Welcome everyone to another exciting journal club. Tonight we have a topic that has been requested frequently, so we're happy to finally uh, cover it with an expert. So our topic is persistent postural perceptual dizziness. And our very special guest tonight is Dr. Joel Goebel. And he's gonna further introduce himself a little bit for us if he would. <laughs> yeah, hi everybody. So. Um... I'm Joel Goebel. I come from uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I did my training there at WashU, taken on faculty 1985. Um, opening came in the Dizzy Lab there, and I was trained by a, a, an older otologist named Malcolm Stroud, who if you recognize the name uh, in, in the literature for dizziness. It goes way back. And I was just fascinated with the dizzy patient. So um, I enjoyed the surgery. I am a surgeon. Um, but I also enjoyed the neurology involved with dizziness. So that's, uh, that's been my career, my entire uh, academic life. Um, I retired from clinical practice uh, two years ago in 2020. But I still keep active in research. I'm teaching around the world. Um, I still do lecturing. Uh, so I'm doing all the fun stuff that you can do at this time of your career. So, <laughs> thanks. thanks for the invite. Yeah. Oh, it's a pleasure really to have you. And, um, you know, we're going to talk about, again, this topic, it's frequently requested and I think for good reason because it has some complexity to it. So we're really looking forward to some of your insights. This is the article we specifically selected. Um, you'll see the link on our events page if you need to see that article for yourself as a viewer. And uh, we're going to kind of dig into that article a little bit in a moment. I like to make sure that all of uh, the folks attending, viewing this are on the same page. So when we talk about the vestibular system, we're talking about a system that involves a peripheral sensor, right? So that kind of little vestibular apparatus that's got some fun canals to it in blue there um, near the ear. I don't have it in quite the right place in this picture. It's just kind of more representative. Hopefully everyone knows that. I'll show you the next slide in a second uh, where that lives. And then we have connections, of course, nerves that go to the brain and the different parts of the brain that process information from that sensor that's telling us uh, where we are in space along with our visual information and the information from the joints in our body, right? All that information helps us know if we're upright, leaned over, are we spinning around, what's going on, where are we? All right, so here's the inner ear uh, more detailed. Again, uh, that vestibular apparatus there kind of deep in what we call the inner ear, along with some hearing structures that are the neighbors. So we need to know about all of this information in order to talk about this topic <laughs> uh, because these different structures have a role. Um, and in persistent postural perceptual dizziness, uh, I often explain this to my patients as a sort of a learned dizziness, the brain is functioning a bit differently. And we can talk about that more uh, with Dr. Goebel's input as well. Um, that occurs often after a dizziness event. Um, that's a, a true pathology, we'll call it, meaning a physical issue. BPPV, we've talked about in other uh, journal clubs in the past, these little tiny crystals that live in that vestibular apparatus, they have a job, but sometimes they go to the wrong place. Um, inflammation of the inner ear, things like this. Um, can kind of set off the brain to start to kind of perceive where we are differently even after, say, those crystals have been put back where they belong. Um, how do you explain 3PD to your patients? Oh, you're muted. Hang on. All right, you have to know the evolution of the term. Um, and Jeff Staub from Mayo, the psychiatrist from Mayo, he's, he's really at the forefront of trying to come up with this category of chronic dizziness. So chronic dizziness has been diagnosed for centuries. And throughout decades, it's been called numerous things. It's been called phobic postural vertigo by the Germans, digital vertigo uh, by the Brits, um, chronic subjective dizziness by Jeff Staub, so finally, the Barony Society came together with a working group that said, look, we've got all these terms around the world that are talking about people who seem to be chronically dizzy after an acute event is over, and yet they just don't get over it. Mm -hmm. so, so how do we 
how do we use a terminology that might unify the world to talk about these people? Um, and I, I need to make a point here. It's not just a vestibular injury that tri triggers triple PD. Um, it can be a stressful event in mm -hmm. your life. It can be a head injury. It could be post-traumatic stress disorder. It could be a, a whole host of things that all of a sudden put the body into what's called a maladaptive state. The body responds to whatever the injury, whatever the insult was, and it goes into this sort of fight or flight mechanism to try to work its way through whatever the insult was. But once the insult is over, the body doesn't come out of that. The brain doesn't come out of it. It mm -hmm. maladapts and stays there. And so the initial response of the brain to a vestibular injury to become more visually preferenced and to um, um, be, be really sensitive to body tilt, etc. that's normal. But once the injury is over, the brain doesn't revert back to using senses in a correct hierarchy and creating the right motor responses. And that then triggers the limbic system, which is the height of our emotions. Um, and it triggers this sensation of chronic dizziness. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Why am I dizzy? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? You know, so it becomes almost like uh, Bill Murray's, you know, uh, Groundhog Day. You know, <laughs> the record keeps playing again and again every morning. What's wrong with me? So we have to be a little bit careful because this is a new category. I wouldn't really call it a disease. Mm. I would call it a, a way of looking at chronic dizziness in a more structured way and to be able to study it. Um, and you'll see, I think you have some slides to show criteria for making triple PD yes. diagnosis. Those are, those are Barony Society uh, recommendations that, of, you know, don't just use this as a wastebasket. You know, you, you, have a, you have a way of trying to say, I think you have this maladaptive state and these are the criteria. Mm -hmm. um, it also then allows you to turn to a patient and say, I think I know what's happening to you, and I think we have some ways to help you. And that's why the paper that we're studying tonight is really going after a real key issue. And that is, not only are we trying to help you once it's happened, but can we, yes. after a vestibular injury, predict who it's going to happen to? and stop the train before it leaves the station. I love it. Once the train leaves the station, it's awfully hard to get it back. Right. Right. So that's really, I think that's the most interesting thing. That's what, that's what's really gotten me involved with Aaron Trinidad in the UK and Jeff Staub and John Stone um, and a whole host, as you can see on the paper. Mm -hmm. See, can we come up with a way to um, use this diagnosis or this category um, and then come up with criteria that would help us look at a patient with an injury and say, you know, I think based upon the way you're reacting early in this disease, I think that we should intervene maybe a little bit more to prevent this chronic dizzy state. Uh -huh. Whereas some, some patients, um, depending upon what their, what their personalities are, what their traits are, they may get over it, you know, they get dizzy, you know, had neuritis, they get dizzy, they were dizzy for a few weeks, they go back to work, they're fine. Now, even, even, even if the neuritis, uh, even if the neuritis attack is severe, and yeah. the injury is severe, even if it's severe, some brains won't just adapt. They'll, they'll deal with it, they may do some physical rehab, like BRT, and then they'll adapt and they'll go on, but some brains don't. So I think that's, to me, that's the fascinating part of triple PD. Agreed. All right. That was a wonderful explanation. Thank you so much. So you, you definitely called it. I do have some slides <laughs> with the diagnostic criteria. Um, uh, anyone who's unfamiliar with these, you know, they're easily um, found upon the Internet. So <laughs> if you put in the right terms here, diagnostic criteria for three triple PD, 
um, put in Baronet Society, perhaps, Stav, something like that, you should be able to pull these up, right? So I'm not going to read them out loud per se, um, but just to understand that the descriptors that patients use, in my opinion, are not the only factor. You know, they might call it dizziness. They might call it funny feeling. They might feel off. They might feel floaty. I mean, I've heard <laughs> probably dozens of terms. Uh, would you agree with that, Dr. Goebel? Yeah, and uh, I, I would caution people wanting to use this category to be as precise as you can be. Um, it, again, this could be a big bucket into which you throw a lot of people. And I don't think that you want to do that. Um, I think you want to probably have the Barony Society criteria in front of you and almost as a checklist. Yeah. And when you see somebody that you think is, you know, going to do, is morphing or has morphed into chronic dizziness, um, this whole idea of symptoms lasting for hours long periods of time, waxing and waning, uh, they're, you know, more than half of the days in a month. Very few other dizzy diseases do that. Right. You know, migraine might. Maybe, yeah. Migraine might, but not quite this way. Um, and then if you, do you have other criteria that yep, you have? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. You know, so, I mean, these are, these are, these are people who are provoked by motion being mm -hmm. on their feet and they don't like their own body motion and they don't like visual motion. Mm -hmm. Remember they have developed a hypersensitivity to visual stimuli. They have developed what's called a visual preference, right? Mm -hmm. So they're using their visual system and their eyesight as, you know, inappropriately. And when they see motion, whether it's an optokinetic motion or whether they see it right straight on, um, that really bothers them. So they're, they're, they're best if they're in simple environments and they're not moving, uh, if they're seated, uh, they, they do much better. Um, um, and then you're showing these other criteria um, yeah, they, they can describe this in a lot of ways. They don't always say, I'm dizzy and I'm spinning. Some people feel their body is rocking. Mm -hmm. They'll come in and say, I'm rocking. And say, no, you're not. Say, yeah, I feel I am. Right? And that gets into what's called Mal body vigilance. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a body vigilance. They're, they're, they're in a hypervigilance state. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Right? Yes. So they're sensing maybe one-tenth of a degree of sway, which you can't see. And so they're feeling the sway, and you look at them and say, you're not swaying. But they feel it because they're hypervigilant. Right, right. 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 So I think if you're going to step into this world, study the barony criteria carefully. Um, and then apply them as strictly as possible. Otherwise, you may throw other active diseases into this bucket. You know, you really wouldn't want to throw somebody with an active fluctu fluctuating vestibular disorder or an active central nervous system disorder into this maladaptive state called triple PD. So you want to be very careful that you don't miscategorize active disease and throw them into the triple PD state. Yes, good points all. So, you know, this article nicely has uh, this particular uh, figure in it talking about some of these predisposing <clears throat> factors, which we're about to dig into a little bit more, kind of um, this hyper high body vigilance that you just referred to, um, neur high neuroticism, some other aspects we're going to get to in a second. So just kind of understanding that this is, you know, kind of um, this combination of factors, right? It's not necessarily... Uh, again, what I would consider a simple compared to like, <laughs> I know some people find BBV to be very complex. To me, it's like crystals there where they don't belong. Let's put them back like the little ball game with the, <laughs> you know, with the maze. Okay. And then we put them back and then they feel better. Like that's generally how BBV can work. So this is not, um, I would say at, on the simple side, this is kind of few elements to it. So, you know, as far as the research here that we're looking at, the aim of the study was to look at the frequency of anxiety-related variables um, and uh, predicting that they would be higher in patients who meet the criteria, which we just discussed for 3PD, and also looking at some illness perceptions. And um, so they looked at these different patients. Most of them happened to be female. 
and they matched them with some folks who are not 3PD, but they did have vestibular issues in the past, um, and matched them also with uh, non-disease controls. Um, and I just broke it out here for folks to see. Um, and the only thing that really jumped out at me, and maybe you can speak to this for a moment, Dr. Goebel, is um, that they did not identify anyone with psychological distress as a precipitating factor uh, for anyone who was not a 3PD. Um, and I think that makes sense because the people who are recovered subjects, you know, would not fall in this uh, category of someone who's reporting ongoing dizziness. Do I interpret that correctly? Yeah, and remember, th this is a pilot study, and that we've been very careful with this. Um, we've actually got another paper that's already gone in for review, um, looking at how do we go further with this, and we're in the process of putting together a much more complete study, a case control study. Um, but in this small cohort of patients, um, we had three people who developed a maladaptive state, um, and they, their triggers were psychological. There was a stressor in the family, a death in the family, or some huge event. Sure. Right? So um, I think when you read this paper, I, 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 I like the paper. You know, I've helped write it. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. But I, want, <laughs> but, I, but I want you to be careful about jumping to to too tight of a conclusion mm -hmm. about some of the things that are said because some of the issues are still open for discussion and I'll, I can get into that in a little bit. Right. But I, right. I, but I think the paper at least started to aim us towards the idea that there might be something different about the person who develops triple PD after vestibular insult. There might be something different about the way their brain is wired even before the insult occurred. Right, right. right. Not, not just how they responded after, but maybe there were some predisposing traits that, that they were just almost like a, a maladaptive state waiting to happen. <laughs> right. They're just, they're just waiting for something to happen, and then there they go, you know, then they maladapt. Right. No. And the... And the the researchers in uh, um, in Toronto, uh, Mike uh, Mike Rutka, or I'm sorry, John Rutka and Dave Pothier, who unfortunately passed away, but Dave, oh. they called this catastrophization. It's called catastrophization. Okay, so something happens to us here, and our normal brain's response is, "Oh gosh, let me see if I get in the camera. Oh gosh, what am I going to do? Okay. Oh, this is terrible." But there's a group of people that something happens like this, and they go, oh, my God. Where's up there? Oh, it's way up here. I mean, they catastrophize. Mm-hmm. Right? So, so small things are big, and big things are catastrophic. For sure. For sure. So the, the whole idea of doing this study was to try to decide, can you predict who these people are? Um, and then treat them differently. Right, which led to your some of your outcome measures, right? So these are measures that you did uh, to assess some of these different characteristics, body vigilance scale, which I'd never heard of, sounds pretty cool, uh, the DHI, the Disney Handicapped Inventory, which we've talked about before um, on this journal cloud, very familiar with that one. So a nice range, I would say, of kind of these different ways to look at um, symptoms and kind of self-perception and uh, perception of illness and things like that. And so the results um, we did you know, see uh, were nicely outlined in the article. They did find uh, that 3PD cases had higher neuroticism, introversion, lower conscientiousness, and higher anxiety, and higher body vigilance to dizziness. Um, as well as uh, illness perception and indicated higher level of threat um, compared to the recovered vestibular patients. So anything you want to yeah, add here, go ahead, yeah. jump in. <laughs> yeah, I do. Be careful with this because yes. what we found was if you compare the triple PD dizzy patient to the normals, not, not recovered dizzies, mm. 
Then they have all of these. Those those statistics are not up against dizzy patients who recover. Got it. Those statistics are up against normal people. Okay? And if you read the paper carefully, if you look at the dizzy population for you know, neuroticism, let me pull up. I, want, I don't want to quote out of school here because I've got yeah. the paper. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um... Yeah, so triple PD patients did have a statistically higher body vigilance score up against non-triple PD dizzy patients. Okay, right. so that's dizzy, dizzy to dizzy. Okay, got it. They did, they did not, they did not reach statistical significance for neuroticism. Um. Let me read it. A pairwise comparison between patients with PPPD and recovered vestibular controls for neuroticism approached significance. Got it. P equals, P equals 0.05. The effect size, N squared equals 0.38, was large, indicating a clinically meaningful difference that a larger sample would have revealed as statistically significant. And so the point is that this was, um, this was a pilot study. Right. It didn't have enough power. It didn't have enough people in it to call neuroticism as the trait of leading to triple PD, but it hinted at it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I did the it did the same thing. Um, PPPD cases were found to pay more attention to feelings of dizziness in both control groups. Um, and again, the effect sizes were large, so if you have a larger sample, it comes out even more. So I think what this paper was saying is, I think we're on the right trail, mm -hmm. but this paper didn't nail it to say, oh, if you're a neurotic, okay, um, you know, if you're a catastrophizer, you're going to do this. Okay? Right. It was, a, it was a hint, okay, but what it did say is that if if you tend to pay more attention to your body and where your body is in space, mm -hmm. you know, it's just body vigilance, how your, how your breathing feels, how your heart rate feels, you know, how hot you feel and your temperature, how your sway. Yeah. You know, if you, if you tend to be more attentive to your body, that may be a marker. Once you get a vestibular insult that you might be headed down into a rabbit hole. Right. Right. So I pulled this, um, which is kind of, somewhat summarizing what you're saying in very simple uh, pictorial um, from Holmberg, um, Dr. Janine Holmberg out of mm -hmm. uh, Utah. She has um, written about 3PD. She's an experienced vestibular clinician um, who has spoken on that topic. And I pulled this from a kind of a talk that she had given, um, which kind of is just trying to highlight, I think, what you're saying, which is kind of Again, making it a little more complex than something like 3 um, BPBV, here we have this kind of combination of some sort of catastrophic event, uh, or not, excuse me, some sort of triggering event. Um, they catastrophize it afterwards. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, kind of these different possibly personality traits, possibly, you know, things like this um, kind of body vigilance and or anxiety and or, right? So you're kind of, you're in the ballpark is what I'm hearing, right? So we're kind of getting a sense um, of contributors to um, why, you know, someone might go into a 3PD state. Do you think that that's kind of picturing that? Yeah. yeah, I think it's, I think it's fair. And I think when the dust settles and the studies uh, have enough power to them, I think um, certain traits are going to shake out. Mm -hmm. You know, if I've, I'm a betting person, I would probably say that someone predisposed uh, in a neurotic behavior is probably going to be at risk more for chronic dizziness than someone who's not. Um, I would probably say, I don't know that depression is going to fall out that way. Mm. Hey, I'm not certain that depression is on there. I'm not certain that that's, that's, a, that's a touchy one, and Jeff Staub would probably argue about that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You got to be careful, but because it's it's awfully hard to get good data on personality traits before the injury occurred. Right. <laughs> so yeah. after the injury occurred, everybody's interested. Well, 
Are you sleeping well? Do you have low mood? Or do you worry a lot? Well, hell yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I feel crappy. That's what I see my patients. You're normal. Anyone would feel horrible. Yeah, I, I, of course I do. I feel awful. Right. But that's not what you're looking for. You're not looking for a reactive anxiety or depression, so-called state anxiety. You're looking mm -hmm. for trait anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, do you carry this trait? Okay, so um, I, I think... I don't have any problem with these diagrams. You look in our papers and other papers, we all have these, you know, and, you know, who, who, which person is going to go from the structural deficit to the psychological distress and finally flip into PPPD? No. Well, who goes on to a boat and feels a little sick to their stomach um, and then, you know, but then they adapt to the boat and then they get off and for a little while they feel, you know, you close your eyes and, you know, you come off of a cruise, you're still a little rocky for a day or two and it's gone. And who goes into mal de debarkment? Mm -hmm. So the whole concept of mal de debarkment is a maladaptive state. You adapted to sensory input, but then once the sensory inputs reverted back to normal, you didn't revert back to the normal state you stayed in the maladaptive state right so right. that's i think that's you know that's the that's the million dollar question can you identify traits in a person that is going to predict that they maladapt mm -hmm. and it's a good reminder you know when we talk about risk factors right a risk factor is not a, a certainty right <laughs> so you know yes if i have x trait or if i you know make this particular choice or, you know, if I am you know, in a car accident or whatever, I have X, you know, risk for, you know, whatever injury, but it's not a guarantee. It's just a risk, right? So, you know, that's where I think sometimes I feel like people want A plus B is always going to equal C. <laughs> and I'm always like, it's a little more like the chalkboard with a few different equations all together. <laughs> like, right? Right. Well, I think, and I think here's where physical therapists uh, like yourself and others on this on this webcast, you act almost like they're um, psychologists because you spend an inordinate amount of time with them. Um, whereas perhaps some of their medical team made a very accurate diagnosis, and we talked about this earlier. Mm -hmm. yeah. You need an accurate diagnosis of what happened first, and then you need to know that what happened is over. You know, so that the injury is over, pretty much. You know, I mean, there, you can argue about that. Um, but you need to work um, with people um, and talk to them. And I think that what I saw of my physical therapist when I was in practice, they did wonderful. You spend an hour with a patient. You know, no, no physician spends an hour, except maybe in an initial visit. Right. But you're spending an hour with them and walking them through exercises and you know, VOR times one and, and gait and time to get up and go and all sorts of stuff. And less hanging on cushions. And, and you're really working them through different sensory inputs. Mm -hmm. You're acting a lot like some of the psychological cognitive behavioral therapy <laughs> you know it's not necessarily mindfulness based therapy but it's cbt in a sense mm -hmm. um, because they're spending a lot of time with someone who hears them and listens to them and says i understand you're dizzy and we're going to work our way through this and i'm going to walk you through slowly yeah and i think you spoke well to you know while we don't want to throw everybody in this bucket if it comes down to this is what seems to be going on i've had patients who feel significantly better just feeling like okay yes it's not a tumor <laughs> it's always like i feel like the first thing people are afraid of which is understandable um tumors right. can be scary um they had an aunt that had one or whatever right so they like that's in their mind and right. then they're afraid of it coming back am i going to feel really really bad again and you know so there's kind of all these stages of of normal you know fears again and then maybe some hypervigilance on top of that and so yeah, you know, we're literally talking them down from the ledge a little bit. I feel like as as uh, clinicians, and certainly since you know, we do get to spend more time as PTs, you know, to say 
you're you're doing a good job. It was take it day by day. Your recovery is not necessarily going to be linear. It might be a little more roller coaster, but the the trend is going to be up. You know, all these educational uh, you know phrases <laughs> that I tend to use, and I think other clinicians like me use, and we can talk more about right. that. But well, this this works best in my mind when. Um, you have a multidisciplinary team agreeing mm-hmm. that this is the case. Um, if one of us throws this out at a patient without really mm. having consensus of the team that you're right, you know, I, 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 when I saw patients in the center, we had access to neurology, we had access to psychiatry, we had access to physical therapy and audiology and occupational therapy and all okay so once once we decided that this is what was happening um if two or three brains looked at this and agreed i think you've got a pretty good chance that you know patients will feel really good about this that yeah wow well, you know this team looked at this and these people say this if one of us comes up with it we might be right you know but it's not it's not as it's it, it's not perhaps as accurate mm-hmm. it's not perhaps as useful as it is when the, you can turn to a patient and say, your medical provider says this, your physical therapist says this, your audiologist says this, you know, your caregiver says this, your mother says this, you know, <laughs> you know that, and then, then the patient says, well, I guess they really thought this out. Right. You know, and, you know, and I don't, I don't have any problem handing patients <clears throat> triple PD literature. And handing it to them, and even the articles that we write, you know, because they can decipher some of this. They they can read through the jargon. Sure. And, but you are right. They feel. I think they feel better than just tell them. Well, I don't know why you're crying. Right. I, I have no clue. You know, I'm just going to give you some exercises, and I hope you get better. You know? But if you can give them a give them a plan, this is this is sort of a plan. Here's our plan. Your, your brain is dealing with the senses in an abnormal way, we're going to try to adjust that. We're going to try to get your brain to 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 coordinate senses more normal so right. that you can, you can move in your environment and not feel so dizzy. For sure. And I want to address two things you brought up. One is there are PTs, for example, out there that have told me, look, I don't have a clinician in my area that's kind of versed in this. Um, I'm sure you can imagine, you know, certain areas, uh, the country and the world. Um, so, you know, we can talk at the end about resources, but, you know, just understand that you may be the first clinician to kind of say in your head, <laughs> I think it might be this and that's okay. Um, you know, but like you say, it's, it's ideal if you can try to find um, a couple clinicians that, you know, have some ability to, you know, maybe go through the criteria or educated on that, whether it's a neurologist, neurotologist, it's less to me about title and more about um, discipline, I'll say, like a physician of some sort, ideally. And then, you know, maybe, um, like you say, an audiologist or an ENT practice that has done some testing to rule some things out, things like that we'll talk about as options. I think the first thing is when you, when you hang your shingle to do this, um, and when you hang your shingle to do this, the first thing you got to do is look around in your community and build a team right away. Don't wait until your patients start flowing in and then you've got all sorts of problems. And then you say, oh my gosh, where am I going to send them? If you're going to, if you're going to step into this arena, then I think you're going to have to look around in your community as, as best as possible. And that community may be a telehealth community. Uh-huh. I made this a point to a couple of... PTs that pushed back that said, well, I don't have an MD for 200 miles. Yeah, you do. You have telehealth. You know, we have tele. We're, look, at, look at us. And, you know, this is going around the world. You know, and so there's, there's a really, really good way to present a patient by telehealth to a, to a colleague and, and say, this is what I think. And they say, yeah, I think you're right. Boom. Okay. That's just about as good as if they were sitting in your community. So now with all the technology that we have, I don't think we have any real good excuse anymore to say, I can't get help. Mm-hmm. Just maybe can't get help in the old fashioned way, but you can get it, you can get it by technology. And you may have to support your patient if they're not 
you know, in that tech realm, you know, to kind of try to support them through that. I know that there's been a couple patients that I've needed to do that for a little bit, and that's okay. Right. Well, I mean, primarily, though, in the tech realm, meaning that you as the PT develop the mm -hmm. relationship with the neurologist, you know, 500 miles away or the, you know, either at Hopkins or, you know, there at the coast or wherever you want to go, you know, develop those relationships. And you'd be surprised that, you know, you know clinicians will be willing to help. Yeah, you make you know, a good and point. And develop these liaisons. So, you know, don't throw your hands up just because, you know, I don't have any in my community and I'm the only one that's going to make diagnose a triple PD. I, I think you'll find yourself a bit frustrated because um, it's it's not it's it's not one of those diagnoses or one of those entities that's really tightly defined quite yet. You know, so I think you need some help. You know, you need to use the criteria for barony carefully and you need to to talk it over with a colleague on on a team that says, Am I thinking correctly here? Oh yeah, that's that's really good thought process. And you know, then you can carry on with it. Definitely. So I want to kind of touch base a little bit. I have had a few clinicians ask me, uh, oh, can we just image a patient and know that they have 3PD? I hope that everyone understands that if there's criteria, you know, that that's our go-to here. And there has been some work done, which I'm sure you're well aware of, um, you know, to try to look at functional, this is kind of an active brain, if you will, in action, um, to see what's happening um, in the study by Indovina. Uh, in 2021 that took a look at that. So this is kind of the kind of explanation that they described in the article about different areas that are, you know, either less active or more active in someone with 3PD. And I like better the kind of interpretation. Um, so we understand that as you described, it seems to be a tendency to reduce the use of vestibular input. So we're favoring that visual input. We're kind of you know, visually dependent is a term I've heard as well, and not really necessarily being as good at integrating all of our sensory information, right? So this is something as a vestibular clinician, um, and if, as a PT, I feel like is one of my jobs, like you're talking about, just kind of helping them use their sensory systems better. Uh, sometimes you use that language, feel your feet, feel your knees are over your ankles, <laughs> feel your shoulders are over your hips, you know? Right you know, breathe through your belly, those kind of things. It does kind of have some mindfulness element to it. I do not think that's bad. Um, I think it's a good way to try to get the patient to kind of check in with good information and kind of go there first. And then we start to add in the ability to properly use vision and hopefully uh, use vestibular input better. Um, and then that other piece here um, from the brain activity standpoint, they found that same thing you're describing. Um, so that does at least link up <laughs> uh, that kind of increase in areas showing, you know, kind of maybe some of this hypervigilance or anxiety related mechanisms um, as they connect to the areas of spatial awareness. So do you want to add anything right. about that study or kind of thoughts on it? Well, it makes, it, it makes sense because the brain is not going to generally use a faulty system and if the vestibular system is injured, then it's a, it's a natural tendency to default to another system. And so sensory integration between visual, vestibular, and somatic sensation is, is, is automatic and it's beautiful when it's all working well. Um, when one system is damaged, the brain is going to, going to scurry and default to try to find the correct inputs or what it thinks is the correct inputs. The, the problem is that the domain of the visual system is far different than the domain of the vestibular system. Uh, the, the, the visual system is a sort of a low frequency system. It, it, it can't manage um, high, mo high frequency movement and can't give correct orientational information and it can also easily get fooled. Mm -hmm. With a damaged vestibular system, the vestibular system is sort of the divining rod in your brain of, of all the other senses. So almost everything, if you can imagine this, the, the visual system is compared up against the vestibular system. The somatosensory system is compared up against the vestibular system. So when the vestibular system is working correctly, um, it, it is the primary default. 
Okay. Now, if the vestibular system is off, you know, then in come all these other senses. And it's like, well, this isn't quite right. You know, and so its comparisons are faulty. Okay, so therefore the brain may try to say, well, I'm just going to go with what my vision says, or I'm going to be, I'm going to develop a support surface dependency. Mm -hmm. You know, you you give me the slightest little bump in my support surface, and I'm down. Right. Okay. You've had patients like that, right? Support <laughs> surface dependent and visually dependent. Okay. So that 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 makes sense. And then what happens is. The, the limbic system, uh, the hypothalamus and the thalamus, um, the, it becomes triggered. You know, just like tinnitus, it's the same as chronic tinnitus. Yeah. You know, a little bit of tinnitus, eh, fine, no problem, you know, my ears are ringing. Once it gets to the point where the limbic system is activated, now it's like, oh my God, I can't take this tinnitus. You know, it's, it's, I can't sleep, I can't concentrate. Right. So it's the, same, the same maladaption with dizziness. For sure. All right. Well, you already hinted at this being a recommendation, so I love that we're on the same page. Um, this is, again, from Janine Holmberg's uh, paper uh, that she, a presentation she had, and so I kind of pulled that. It's just a nice way to take the Baronet criteria for 3PD and put it in kind of a checklist to help you as a clinician, especially if you're kind of just getting familiar to kind of just kind of, again, you're not necessarily showing this to the patient. This is just something, you know, you're going to be looking at and saying, okay, you know, is this fitting, um, you know, kind of the criteria and helping you as you go through your next steps, whether that's referral, telehealth, et cetera, to kind of sort out if it's to the point where a patient might officially get this diagnosis. Um, also, it's very much um, that last criteria that cannot be fully explained by other conditions. So you must do your due diligence, which you completely uh, described earlier. So, you know, this is where, at least as a PT, I'm going to do an exam. I don't want to see anything that says, huh, this looks like stroke. Like if I'm seeing, you know, you know, a huge intention tremor, things that look like cerebellar involvement, you know, we got to look at these things. We can't just jump to uh, 3PD, right? So. If we see signs of central vestibular dysfunction, um, we are, of course, going to check in with a physician who is taking care of this patient, say, hey, I'm concerned. <laughs> I'm seeing these, you know, central signs. Um, and, you know, they might need some sort of further testing or imaging. So it's a conversation to have, again, a team approach, as you described. So it's not just kind of any one clinician working in a silo here trying to sort out, you know, this kind of uh, condition. And then... Um, you know, I, you kind of alluded to how vestibular migraine is kind of what I would call the clo closest potential mimicker. So you definitely want to check out the Baronet vestibular migraine criteria, listening for a history of migraine and other kind of key factors like um, somebody who has a family history of migraine, things like that. I have had lots of patients who had headache and then they stopped having headaches, but they started having this episodic dizziness. <laughs> so, you know, kind of just listening for those things. Anything you want to add here? Yeah, so migraine can actually be, vestibular migraine can actually be the trigger for triple Right. <laughs> so you have to try to tease out when did you, you know, when did you cross over to the dark side? <laughs> when, when did you go from, you know, episodic vertigo spells with light and sound sensitivity, you know, maybe some cephalgia, um, you know, etc. You know, it sounds very much vestibular migraine. When did you morph into this more all day, every day? And so when you get a migraine patient who starts talking to you about, yeah, you know, I've, I've had this every day for the last month. Well, that's a bit unusual for migraine to be that. Mm -hmm. so not that it can't happen, um, but to be that pervasive day in and day out for a month, you know, and, and, and they may, the light sensitivity may not be there. I find photophobia and phonophobia to be absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. You know, especially photophobia. You know, phonophobia can be a lot of things. Can be canal dehiscence. Can be, can be Meniere's disease. Uh, can be lots of things. Uh, but photophobia, as a as a trigger, um, unless there's some horrible eye disease or, intra, or intracranial hypertension or something, migraine. You know, dizzy and photophobia go together for migraine, right? So now, now you have a migraine patient that doesn't have that anymore, and they're just dizzy all day, every day. Well, maybe they crossed over. Right. Um, you're identifying a, a real challenge here because you're talking sometimes about patients who start with a PT and get referred back 
for diagnosis. Which happens a lot. <laughs> well, I'm talking about patients who start with an MD and get the get the diagnosis of triple PD and then they go to PT to get help. Um, remember, the treatment of triple PD is three prongs. Mm-hmm. And the, the physical therapy, and it's not vestibular rehabilitation therapy. It is it is primarily just habituation therapy. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily classic VRT. Because you may have some patients whose VOR is working just fine. Right. And so and one of the things that is starting to come out is that triple PD doesn't correlate with the, with the extent of vestibular injury. A patient could have had a tiny little bit of injury in their inner ear and gotten a lot of triple PD. Or they could have had big injury in their inner ear and they never developed triple PD. Right. And so, so physical therapy isn't necessarily... Um, a, BRT it is a vestibular rehab in the classic sense, but that's one limb is therapy. The other limb is medication, and some of these patients are, need to be medicated. And you are not going to walk them down off of this pathway without some sort of medication to address the limbic system's responses. Mm-hmm. And so the SSRIs and SNRIs, particularly the SNRIs, serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, they have been very helpful. In patients with um, with with triple PD, in combination with therapy, and then some of them actually do need to see a cognitive behavioral therapist. They need to get into a much more formalized, mindfulness-based uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Absolutely, program. and I do have one quick question about meds because this has come up um, in a, a post that I had put up about this upcoming talk where there was a concern that some medications, of course, have side effects, including SSRIs and SNRIs, um, and the concern specifically brought up, so I just want to have you have the opportunity to address it briefly, is um, sexual dysfunction or se- impact on um, uh, any kind of area like that. So are you aware of that side effect? Is that a big yeah. concern, no. very common, no. not common? It's there. Yeah, the patient needs to know. And... Um, yeah, you know, these many antidepressants carry the capability of sexual dysfunction, and if it happens, then you have to decide how effective is the drug with your symptoms versus what's it doing to you. And if it's if it's if it's not tolerable, then you change. You know, it, it isn't that every class of SNRI does it. Got it. You know, you, you can maybe be changed around. Okay, um, but if it happens, then the patient will tell you, "I can't tolerate this." And then you walk them off slowly off of it. Try another one, and if that doesn't work, then you you avoid the drug. Yeah. Got but that's it. no that's no reason to categorically say no. <laughs> that's a good so point. Then, good yeah. point. So other questions that have come up, um, kind of our full differential diagnosis. So, you know, some of these patients, you know, may need to have um, a simple or more involved testing, and you might do a full kind of ENT workup, as I would consider it, calorics maybe a V-hit, maybe rotary chair, um, as part of kind of this ruling out other conditions before you would go right to 3PD. Um, is that a kind of a pathway you've seen? Well, all of these tests look for damage that's already been done. And so that doesn't rule in or rule out triple PD. That Got just it. Says, that just says, what's the extent, what's the, what's the evidence that you've had a vestibular insult? Sounded like you did, you know, you woke up really spinny dizzy and you vomited and, you know, couldn't walk for a day and then you slowly got better and now you developed this chronic dizzy. Oh, it sounds like you had neuritis. Okay. So now you do the head impulse and yes, you have a positive head impulse refixation saccade and, you know, dynamic visual acuity is down and your caloric is reduced on that side. You know, rotary chair shows decreased gain, increased phase lead, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, Vestibular function tests don't rule in or rule out triple PD. You don't actually need them for that. What you do need is if you if you want to know the extent of what happened mm-hmm. in the beginning, you know. But that doesn't apply to what's happening now. That Got it. that just says what happened. Yeah. Perfect. All right. And I did have a question come up uh, for someone who registered, ruling out cervicogenic dizziness. Um, I have a little bit of uh, knowledge on this as far as some tests you might do to see if the neck um, is contributing to how a patient feels, uh, but I would still personally go back to that um, 
Veronay criteria for 3PD and really look at that carefully before you would say yes or no if the person has a cervicogenic dizziness component. Anything you want to add there? Yeah, so cervicogenic dizziness does exist. I don't believe in cervical vertigo. I believe cervicogenic dizziness. And what you're doing is you're activating the stretch receptors in the neck, mm -hmm. which then send a signal back up to the brainstem. You know, because the, the, the neck is not just a post holding your head on the body. It, it, it's actually giving orientation of how the body is oriented vis-a-vis -vis the head, right? Right. right? So, the, so the brain can know whether I'm this way or whether I'm this way, you know, just by how the neck is stretched, okay? So cervicogenic dizziness, I think, is a reasonable diagnosis in someone with neck trauma. Mm -hmm. Diagnosis in someone with advanced cervical arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis. Um, you know, everybody's worried about um, vertebral artery compression. Um, hard to do. Uh, the only thing you really don't want to do is move the neck fast. Right. right? That's when you run the risk of dissection. So I, I think that cervicogenic dizziness is probably a pretty low contributor mm -hmm. to triple D. Um, and I, I, if, if I ever got patients that I thought the neck was the problem, I gave them a cervical collar and I gave them a muscle relaxant and I asked them how they felt in a week. And the ones that I thought were the, that the neck was the problem, they called back and said, I feel great, doc. As long as the collar's on for two hours a day, take the pressure off my neck and the muscle relaxant, I took the muscle relaxant, I feel great. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, you can get a lot fancier with all the other, uh, you know, neck torsion tests and, you know, looking for the cervical ocular reflex and all that jazz. It's probably pretty low contributor to triple PD. Right. On the flip side, I would say as a PT, most of my patients, regardless of whether they have um, neck discomfort or more um, just kind of have a vestibular issue, they all tend to be pretty guarded. <laughs> so I do give them you know, some sort of probably what I'll call neck care, whether that's mm -hmm. just gentle ranging or maybe a little gentle stretching if they're not hypermobile. Um, you know, it just depends on the case. But, you know, I still still attend to the neck, but it's not necessarily because I think that's the root issue. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, um, but just kind of put a plug in for, for the neck needs care because, you know, it's very no, normal. Yeah. No, I agree with that. But it, 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 this is a chicken or an egg argument. Is the neck causing the dizziness, or is the dizziness causing the neck stiffness? Right. <laughs> when you have, and when you have a vestibular disorder, you don't want to move your head, mm -hmm. and so you tend to freeze. You tend to freeze your head on your body, and you tend to move as a unit. Right. Not move freely. Right. So you know you you, you have to tease out: is the neck stiffness the cause of the dizziness? Or is the neck stiffness the result of the disease? Right. Agreed. All right. So um, this is a detailed slide. Um, but what I'll say in summary is that there are lots of other measures that, for example, a vestibular PT might use, like a motion sensitivity quotient or the visual vertical analog scale, which looks at are we sensitive to visual input and patterns and things. So just if you're newer to this area, you know, explore these a little bit. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me um, and I can point you in the right direction if you need more resources. But just know that there's a lot that we can look at as clinicians to try to sort out kind of what are the symptoms that are really the issue for the patient so we can develop an individualized treatment plan um, to kind of address, for example, some patients' checkerboards are fine, but they hate lines or vice versa. So just know that sometimes, you know, if you're trying to desensitize them to visual input, you're not going to start with the hardest thing, but you might work towards those and you want something that's going to be a little bit of a challenge so they can get that brain uh, to become less sensitive from a habituation standpoint, as Dr. Goebel mentioned. Um, and I, just... let, me, let me say something just quickly yeah, here. Yeah. I, have, I, have, I have a friend, he's a PT, uh, or they call him physio in the UK. <laughs> and Andrew Clements, and Andrew's brilliant, and he works at the University of Leicester, and I've, I've taught that course for the last 20 years in the UK. He's, he's a, a huge proponent of rehabilitating people um, in the 
environment without giving them any environments. He doesn't give them checkerboards. He doesn't give them lines and squiggles, etc. He says, okay, what bothers you? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, um, uh, moving scenery bothers me. Okay, let's go over here down the hall or let's go outside or let's go to the mall or let's... He, he goes he goes where they he goes into the environment that they describe bothers them and then he rehabilitates them in that environment i thought that was very clever rather than imposing an environment you know from some book that says this is the environment you ought to be in no he says what is the environment and he he showed some remarkable responses mm-hmm. to people after a particular injury doing it that way yeah, no, and I, I don't disagree. I think there are patients who need a graded entry. And if you they said, oh, I hate wave, ocean waves, if you put on a video of ocean waves, because you probably aren't near the ocean unless you're really lucky, um, <laughs> then that might be too much that first day. So you are trying to find kind of alternative, lighter, um, I think, stimuli to start, just to, as my kind of personal experience. And there is some literature from just general vestibular, um, the decreasing visual dependence, like Dr. Pavlov's work, uh, Pavlo, um, in the UK as well. But I think, you know, you're right. I think it's good to really look at what, you know, actively bothers the patient. I do have the patient progress to like the CVS or the Home Depot, even, you know, outside of my clinic, um, past uh, videos and things. And that's where the virtuality, which we did a whole journal club on last month, and I encourage you to watch that, um, those of you who are out there. But I know Dr. Goebel's working on some exploration um, and some sort of treatment like that, because then it's very uh, accessible for patients um, in clinic and then potentially for home care, uh, home treatment. That was, that, was my next, that was my next comment, was virtual reality is going to be the next step here. You know, we can. We only have a limited number of environments that we could conceivably put somebody in practically. Right. You know, but but virtual reality can put them in thousands of environments, and just think of what you could do with, with telehealth. Yeah. Uh, with telehealth and virtual reality, it could be it could be programmed remotely. You could put them through a progressive series of exercises. They're 500 miles away. They've got somebody there to make sure they don't fall, and you just you just change their visual environment, and then you can change their somatosensory by putting them on different surfaces. So you can do a whole bunch of things with VR. Absolutely, I totally agree. So I'm gonna kind of breeze through these because I know we're running short on time. This is all coming from Dr. Holmberg and Dr. Wellen's talk that I attended recently on 3PD, just talking about from a physical therapy standpoint how it's important to start the patient on just kind of the basics, um, you know, making sure they're getting good sleep, um, getting them on some kind of aerobic exercise where it's walking, a sitting, you know, cycle, whatever they can do, um, you know, relaxing their breathing. Then you're working on core, getting kind of them to start to be somatosensory, kind of using their strength and kind of body awareness, sensory reweighting, balance training, of course. And then that, that kind of piece we were just talking about, the habituation piece, visual motion, desensitization, um, and getting into that real world. So we really covered that. And I just want to give a hint for anybody who's out there. Sometimes as per, part of our sensory training, we use a weighted vest. Um, so you can use a lightweighted vest. I use a four pound with some of my patients just kind of to get them to feel their body more. Initially, it can be a nice bridge tool. I like to call it a bridge. It's not something they use forever, uh, but it can be helpful. So just something to think about. And Reactive is a great uh, PT clinic out in California that has some posts on their social media about this. So I think this covers the summary of what we just talked about, a maladaptive cycle. (laughs) Um, And the take-home message here from the article is, that negative illness perception may be a key element. We'll see as we get more research. We're excited about that. Um, and if we can intervene early um, with folks who may be at vulnerable for 3PD, can we even head it off or limit it um, to a very light case as opposed to a, a strong chronic case where I have someone coming into me who's had chronic dizziness for 10 plus years? Uh, that can be a lot harder to tackle. So. Um, here we're just have some resources listed for everybody, um, how you can find Dr. Goebel, um, a nice dizziness pocket card that he and, uh, Dr. Z and some other clinicians, uh, worked on. 
Um, and I've got some links here for everybody. So screenshot this if you want, so you can explore these later. Um, and we're going to go into our opportunity for questions. So very good work. All right. Looks like we have some questions out the gate here. Uh, Connie Thompson, to clarify, mouthy department patients are more symptomatic when they are still and then they feel that they're rocking and 3PD patients feel their symptoms more like rocking or what have you with upright posture and active passive movement. Anything else to separate those two? What do you have for us, Dr. Goebel? Say, it, oh, say that again. I was just reading what was on the Oh, slide. yes. How do you separate maldi debarkment and 3PD, would you say? Well, good question. You know, maldi debarkment to me, I need, the, the trigger needs to be a motion provoking event. So, I, and I think they probably follow a very common pathway, you know, that the, the brain, instead of being injured, it just adapted to um, an altered environment. You, know, you could have the same thing with space if you went up in the spaceship, you know, and you went into microgravity. You know, you, you could maybe maladapt, and when you came back to Earth, you couldn't, you know, handle the otolith cues anymore because you adapted to space. Um, and, the, and, the, and the novel astronauts, the first-time astronauts, do have a lot of trouble walking out of the capsule. You don't see them right out for hours because they can't walk, because the otolith cues are being, uh, are, are being misinterpreted as translations mm. of gravity, so they feel like they're being shown. Um, so I think the, the short answer is I think mounted debarkment and triple PD share a common pathway. If I were to give a... Give a uh, you know, try to just to differentiate between the two. I'm looking for the motion induced, and it isn't always a shift. That's the classic, but it it needs to be some persistent motion to which that person could adapt to that movement. And then when that movement stopped, they never readapted. All right, great points. Um, we're looking for part one of Jeff Walter had a series of lovely questions, but I must guess hit his part two here. At our balance center, we struggle with offering. 3PD as a diagnosis. Are you concerned um, that it may um, inhibit patients' ability to recover? Do they feel like they're going to be stuck in this, or do you feel like it's helpful? What is your experience? Um, has it gone either way, or usually helpful? What do you think? Um, my experience is that it has been helpful. Um, as long as you can convince the patient that it is a well thought out and codified category. Mm -hmm and not just some new bucket that they're being thrown into. Got um, it. And, and I think they will, they will understand it. You know, you, you, you don't, you don't, you, you gotta be careful how you, how you explain it to them. Um, but I think they will understand if you say that you had an injury, the brain tried to adapt to it, and once the injury was over, it couldn't go back to normal life. You know, you won't go into the details and then you know, the synapses and the cortex and all of that. Just so they, I, th I think they feel better. And I hand them triple PD articles. They love it. I mean, just educate them. They, you know, and they don't believe me. I hand them Jeff Stobbs. Jeff Stobb wrote a wonderful chapter on chronic subjective dizziness and then morphing into um, triple PD. Um, I hand them the Barony Society criteria. I mean, their people are smart. And, you know, they can work through it. Um, I hand him Aaron Trinidad. Aaron Trinidad is the lead, art, is the lead author in all our articles. Mm -hmm. He's a consultant in the UK. Uh, I hand him those articles. You know, their literature, their, their, their literature reviews. You know, and then they, they look at it and say, yeah, that, that, is, that is me. I, I see <laughs> myself. You know, so I, I, think it's, I, think it's, I think it does more good than harm. I think what really does harm is when you say, well, I'm... Sorry for your chronic dizziness. We'll work on your chronic dizziness, but you can't really give it a, you know, give it a name, give it a, give it a marker. I think Got it. Patients like to have a marker. Mm -hmm. Now, Ben is asking, if we as vestibular therapists are the first to suspect 3PD, who do you suggest um, that they sh we should be referring um, as a comprehensive care team? So who should be on that team, do you think, besides that vestibular therapist who's suspecting it? Well, okay, so triple PD, we're going to talk about triple PD in, in our world, which has come from some sort of vestibular injury, okay? Let's just stay with that, you know, not the post-traumatic stress 
trigger or the psychological trigger. Let's just stick with. So you need to back up and get to the th get to the expert who can diagnose the the initial event. Okay, to try to give you an idea of what happened and how much damage there is in there. Okay, so I would make liaisons with a neurotologist or an otoneurologist that can have access to the testing with the vestibular audiologist that would be doing the testing. So at least you have an idea what was the event. Okay. Um, and, and then I think on the team, besides that person plus yourself as a physical therapist um, and with the audiologist doing the testing, um, would, would be the person who's willing to prescribe the medications that might be necessary. And then some neurotologists feel fine with the SSRIs and SNRIs and some don't. And some go to psychiatry. Okay, so that's another potential team member is a psychiatrist who would be able to comfortably prescribe SSRIs or S. NRIs, okay. It, it might be. So, so some of my colleagues were not. I was comfortable with it. I got used to what I was prescribing, but some weren't. And, uh, you know, and some, when you start opening up this bucket, you're opening up um, treatment of long standing disorders. You know, maybe they get in, they get a psychological evaluation, find out that they're truly um, bipolar mm. or that they're OCD mm -hmm. or that. A whole host of access one psychiatric diagnoses. And what about primary yeah. care? Are they having a role in this prescribing or not necessarily? No, I don't think they want to do that. I, I think they're very uncomfortable. These, the, the SSRIs and SNRIs, I didn't find many of my primary cares wanted to take that script over. Got it. If I started a drug, I pretty much kept it or I turned it over to their neurologist. Got it. Or, or their psychiatrist. Okay, mm -hmm. not not every drug will be each patient. These are psychiatrists. Don't get me wrong. That's that's, that's not where I'm, where we're headed. But in difficult cases, you might need to get a help. Got it. Okay. Terry Deal's asking, why do you believe that an SNRI is more effective than an SSRI for three PD? Well, because the SNRI is both a serotonin and a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So you're inhibiting two neurotransmitters. And both of those neurotransmitters are involved in the limbic system. So you're getting sort of a double hit, whereas the SSRIs is just a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. You're only hitting one, you're only hitting the serotonin receptor. Mm -hmm. So, and if you look at the studies, uh, and I don't want to name drugs here because I don't think that's appropriate, but I think that it's, I, I think it's, I, I think, the connoisseur of these drugs is the psychiatrist. If there's any question about it, which one of these, even within those categories, the neurologist might be helpful. The psychiatrist knows these drugs like the back of their hand. Got it. Okay. So Jeff Walter did have a first comment. I'll read that out. Hi, Dr. Goebel. Appreciate your insightful comments. From a research perspective, I understand the value of unifying terms for patients with these traits. Uh, we talked about why it's therapeutic um, in many cases to offer that 3PD diagnosis. And then there was a third comment that he made uh, where he was asking about the concept that I think I've heard a few other people suggest, which is that sometimes 3PD is the diagnosis of we, it's not anything else that we've ruled out, so we do call it this because it meets the criteria, but it's just something maybe else that we don't understand yet. What do you think about that? Well, sure. Yeah. So remember, this this is a new category, and new categories are always open to being nibbled at at the fringes that you didn't quite have it right. You know. So I think that the Barony Society has done the best that they can to come up with criteria that are workable, usable, um, and will lead to uh, the best categorization that you can that this patient has this maladaptive status called triple PD. Um, when the dust all settles, if you saw 10,000 patients with triple PD, could you have 10, 50, you know, 100 that turned out to have something else? I'm always worried about, always worried about the subtle, ongoing peripheral or central event that you haven't diagnosed. You know, you don't, you would never, you know, I don't want to scare people, but you'd never <laughs> want to misdiagnose, you know, progressive supranuclear palsy. Right. Or, Right, or some sort of degenerative neurologic disorder for triple PD. Got to be careful there. Mm -hmm. So once you've 
once you've said this, you've always got your eye open that that this is this fits. Mm-hmm. I think if you treated him as triple PD and you gave you gave him the habituation therapy, maybe you gave him an, an SNRI, maybe you did some cognitive therapy behavior therapy, and they got better. Mm-hmm. You know, then I think you you pretty much proven that you're on the right track. Right. No, for sure. All right. Well, we'll definitely over time. I don't know if we have any more questions, but if you do, feel free to put them in the comments and we'll try to answer them after. So thank you so much, Dr. Goble, for being with us. Very, Welcome. very helpful. Uh, again, a very complex condition. I think this will help a lot of folks understand better um, what, what next steps should be as we care for these patients. So um, thank you, everyone. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I have to say hi. I said to Jeff. Jeff and I lectured together a long time ago. Hi, Jeff. Aww, that's awesome. No, Jeff is fantastic, as are you. So thank you very much again. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We look forward to you. Uh, you being with us next month. Thank you, Dr. Goble. Good night. Good night.